there was once a poor man who had a very large family. And at one, as he aged, he became struck with a severe illness and was le- left to his bed. And it became clear that the last days of his life were at hand. He was dying on, there on his bed, in his deathbed. And so, as such, as, as most people would, he called all of his children to himself. He called them to his bedside to say goodbye to them. And he said to them this, this little message. He said, it is my time to leave you. With my dying lips, I ask you to love and serve God until he calls you unto himself. And it was such a struggled and labored message, even that simple sentence, that he had to pause at times to, 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 to strengthen himself to utter those words. And at that, at those words, his children began to weep. But when they looked upon his father's, their father's face, they saw a serene countenance, a look of true joy upon his face. And he didn't shed a single tear, even though this was his goodbye message to his family. And his daughter, the youngest daughter, seeing that, asked him how he could be joyful in such a time of sorrow saying that you had not only a hard life, but now you're dying an agonizing death. And the father said to her, drew her close and said, when I was a little boy, my mother taught me this. She said, trust in the Lord and fear his name. And these words, these few words, give me courage in my trials, where they were my defense, in times of danger, and are my greatest consolation now. If you do likewise, you will find at your death that you will be filled with the same virtue of hope. And it's that virtue of hope that I want to teach you a little bit about today. That's what we'll talk about. It's It's a virtue that I think people think about, but they really don't necessarily pull it apart. And they really, and it's something that we probably reflect on, not as often as some of the other virtues that are out there. But what is the virtue of hope? The virtue of hope is such a powerful virtue as shown by that old man in the story because it helps us to make that good death. It helps us to go to God without a troubled soul if we live constantly trying to foster that very sacred virtue. So, as a definition for hope, We could say that hope is the confident expectation of all the things Christ promised us with regard to the fulfillment of God's will. So let's break that apart a little bit further. First off, we could really probably break it into two pieces. First is that confidence in the the confident expectation of Christ's promises. Christ's in, throughout the scriptures, has made promises to us of eternal life, of eternal paradise, of heaven, of the greatest joy that we could ever know for all eternity there as a reward waiting for us, should we live a good and faith-filled life. And it's important for us to understand, not just to know by, by word, but to really understand that, that Christ, in saying these things, Christ is God. Christ is not a liar. He's the furthest thing from that. And to even even say that in that, that sentence, Christ is not a liar, almost sounds absurd in itself. Because to think of God as lying is just impossible. It would not be the good God. He would not be all good in his very essence if he were to tell a lie. And so, knowing that he's not a liar, we have to trust in that fact. We have to put our full trust in the fact that he'll never lead us astray. And so as such, we have confidence in that end, that end of salvation, those, that fulfillment of the promises, if we love and serve him here in this life. He's good for his word. No matter how many times we may have offended him in our life, if we try to search after loving and serving him, in our lives, then he will help us to get ourselves to heaven. 
This is the end that we always strive for, and we have to trust in it. We have to expect it in our lives. The second part is that if we fulfill God's will, what does it mean to truly fulfill God's will in our life? I think that's something that oftentimes gets almost mysticized in people's eyes. People think that God is going to come down with a handwritten note and tell you exactly what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go and how he, you know, what the words he wants you to say. But that's not what God's will is going to be in any of our lives. He's not going to give us that handwritten note. But he does expect certain things from us. He does reveal his will in many different other ways. He reveals his will to us in his commandments that he's given us. He reveals his will to us by his church and following the teachings of his church. He reveals his will to us by asking us to maintain and preserve and protect that state of sanctifying grace to protect it as the greatest treasure in our lives, and if we were to lose it, to quickly retrieve it as quickly as possible. And it's that sanctifying grace that really actually shows our love of God. This is how we love God, maintaining that sanctifying grace. And we serve Him, and we serve His holy will by our actions in this life. We say our prayers every day. We go to Mass as often as we can. We make acts of charity. We do our duties according to the, our state in life, to the best of our abilities. We follow that state in life which God calls us to. Most of us are called to the married life. Few of us are called to religion or the priesthood. Some of us are called to the single life. Whatever it may be, we try to live that state of life in accordance to what we know God would want from us in that state as best as we can. We do all the things that we can to do it as perfectly as possible. That is how we love and serve God. Loving and serving Him is how we do His will. It's not a mystery. It's actually rather straightforward. When we talk of the virtue of hope, it's necessary for us, in order to understand hope better, the, the positive aspect, the virtuous aspect of it, it's necessary for us to also understand the violations of that virtue. There's really two ways in which we can find the violations of the virtue of hope. If you think of, you know, as St. Thomas explains, you know, the life of sanctity being that, that, that life of moderation, that middle ground, if you will. And we can sin by going too far in either direction, away from that middle ground. Hope is in the middle. We have one side of the pendulum in the way of error, which is presumption. What is the sin of presumption? Presumption is assuming God's mercy without any amendment to our life. Presumption is to adopt that attitude that nothing's going to happen to our soul. Nothing's going to endanger us. I'm not going to go to, to hell myself because God wouldn't want that for me. I'm not going to be condemned for my sins or he'll make sure that I can get to confession in time so I'm not going to try to keep myself from sinning or I don't need to try to change my life. I will one day be able to fix it when I'm old and gray, perhaps on my death. Perhaps whenever, you know, that passion fades away, as sometimes it happens in old age. To presume that we will be able to attain those things. To presume that we, God, you know, won't be just to us, but rather just focusing on that merciful aspect of God. That is the sin of presumption. And we cannot presume that we are saved before we fight the good fight before we've run our course in our lives. So, that is the one side. The opposite side of that, the opposite sin of that, is the sin of despair. Thinking that there is no hope in saving our souls in our lives. Thinking that our sins, for some reason, are unforgivable. That they're just, I'm just so bad that I can't 
be forgiven for my sins. God wouldn't forgive me for my sins. I've offended him in so many ways. Thinking that I can't break habits that I have in my life, that I have no power to be able to chip away at them and to improve myself and to grow in fighting against these sinful inclinations. And in thinking that, so thinking to myself, so why do I even bother trying to? Why do I even bother going to confession if I know I'm going to just fall into those same sins all over again? Thinking that I've gone too long without confession, and that so therefore I just don't go because it's been so long and I'm such a miserable sinner, I don't need to, to fix it anyways. Or to have or to think that I will never make it to heaven in my life. There's just no way I can save my soul. It's just too hard. All of these fall into the category of the sin of despair. Because to believe that is to believe that essentially God doesn't give grace to assist us. To believe that is to say that God wouldn't be merciful to our souls if he sees that earnest trying. To say, to say that he wouldn't give us the opportunities to confess when he knows that we want to do better and improve ourselves. When, he, when we want to conquer our sin. When we want to strive after that last end. That last end of heaven. And so... We don't want to ever despair, because while we still have breath in our, lo- in our lungs and beat of our heart, we're not lost. We're never lost at that point. The virtue of hope allows us to see God as he truly is. He is completely merciful and completely just all at the same time. That doesn't contradict itself. And we can never presume our salvation and act as if I am saved before I have finished the race. But at the same time, if we try to love God, if we try to serve him in this life, if we strive to grow in holiness, if we strive to correct our faults, if we strive to do God's will in our life, why wouldn't we have confidence and a confident expectation of heaven when our last hour comes? God promises us this. He doesn't make that promise to perfect people. He knows that we all have faults. But it's that virtue of hope, knowing that we've tried in our life, knowing that we've striven to serve and to love him, that virtue of hope allows us to trust in his great promise. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Lord.